I consider myself a new player when it comes to the Soulsborne series. Now that I'm thinking about it, I didn't really get into playing video games until the end of the pandemic hit back in 2020. Tonight, I want to speak with you about our nation's unprecedented response to the coronavirus outbreak. In the past two weeks, the number of cases of COVID-19 outside China has increased 13-fold. The World Health Organization has officially called it COVID-19. Coronavirus. 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 So if you would have told me three years ago that I would get experiences that are beyond awe-inspiring, I would have said, well, you were crazy. My first Souls game was Dark Souls 3, and I fell in love with the game. I watched lore videos, studied how the stats worked and game mechanics worked, made different builds, etc. So to find that there are other games that came before Dark Souls 3, and with the highly anticipated Elder Ring around the corner, I was determined to find out what these series of games were like, and ended up becoming my favorite series of games I have ever played through. So I finally took the initiative and bought Bloodborne with the DLC and finally began my wonderful journey. And it was one of the most marvelous experiences of video game and story engineering I have ever had the pleasure of playing through. A true masterpiece. Farewell, good hunter. May you find your worth in the waking world. H.P. Lovecraft heavily influenced the art and narrative direction of this game, so it's no surprise that Curiosity took the best of me and I took the liberty to read some of H.P. Lovecraft's works. Three books in total, two short stories called Dagen and the Nameless City, and his most popular book, The Call of Cthulhu. Now comparing all those books, there are certain patterns and similarities I came across while reading these stories. It almost feels like I'm reading a journal, the narrator describing things happening to him at that moment or what he was feeling at that moment, trying to put his experiences into words. Also, there's no real story or underlying theme that's being told, just experiences. Not only that, but he goes into detail trying to have you imagine how this world or place that they're in looks or how they perceive it. Now comparing Dagon and the Nameless City to Bloodborne, some similarities pop up here and there, but the book it truly pulls reference from is The Call of Cthulhu. In this story, there is a part where a detective is trying to find any lead of a cult after apprehending followers of said cult. Some of the cult followers, when apprehended, said they worshipped the Great Old Ones, who lived ages before there were any men and who came to the young world out of the sky. It is no surprise that in Bloodborne, our version of the Great Old Ones are just called the Great Ones, that can inhabit different planes of existence and also came from the cosmos. They also state that those old ones were gone now, but their dead bodies had told secrets in dreams to the first men who formed a cult which never died. Meaning that once they died, they imparted knowledge to people within their dreams and ultimately ended up making a cult around that knowledge. And from what we see in Bloodborne most of the time, the way we are able to interact with these beings is through dreams like the Hunter's Dream and the Moon Presence to the Nightmare of Mensis and Mergo. Further adding to the similarities, when the first men came, they spoke to the sensitive among them by molding their dreams. Because that was the only way their language can reach the fleshy minds of mammals. We can compare this text to the hunter's dream in Bloodborne where German the first hunter was trapped by the moon presence, a great one, to do his bidding. The moon presence tells German what it wants, German tells us what to do because he can't do it himself, and you repeat until the hunter's dream is finally collapsing by the end of the game once its purpose has been fulfilled. Many people who researched the lore of this game tried their very best to find motives and what makes the Great Ones act in such a way, but they can't really come to a consensus. The whole point behind the Great Old Ones in the Call of Cthulhu is that everything they brought from the cosmos is completely beyond our understanding, and that of course includes themselves. To give a few examples, near the end of the book, the sailors found the city Cthulhu resided in, Rayla. One of these sailors spoke of the city and instead of describing any definite structure or building, he dwells only on broad impressions of vast angles and stone surfaces. Surfaces too great to belong to anything right or proper for this earth. If you don't fully understand what that means, that's okay. You're not really supposed to. Another example would be when they found the door to release Cthulhu, one of the sailors climbed the edge of the door, or from what I understood, 
One would call it climbing if the thing was not, after all, horizontal. How can you climb something that is, well, horizontal? And when they were being attacked by Cthulhu, one of the sailors tripped when running away and was swallowed up by an angle of masonry which shouldn't have been there. An angle which was acute but behaved as if it were obtuse. How can something have an acute angle yet have the properties of an obtuse angle? The concepts H.P. Lovecraft writes about are beyond mind-boggling. Now, it's very hard to explain structure concepts like that, let alone implement them into a video game. From Software built off the descriptions H.P. Lovecraft made in his books of these creatures. In Bloodborne, a lot of mobs have animal-like characteristics, yet also have a lot of characteristics that are almost out of this world. The story of Bloodborne itself is quite a long one, but once you find the pieces, you start to see what happened to this world and why you are there. Every character you meet has lived a life before you, and it shows when you do interact with them. There are their own written characters with their own set of strengths and flaws. They all have their reasons of doing things and why they act the way they act. The story is just a series of unfortunate events, so it's not a surprise that most characters in this game meet an unfortunate end. So what is the point of Bloodborne? What is the point of the story? What is the story trying to convey? Well, there isn't really a point. The same thing as H.P. Lovecraft's books, there's no overarching lesson. It's just a story that shows what domino effect you can create with what the world presents. From the Sumerians, an ancient race finding an eldritch truth leading up to Yarnum and its beast infected streets. It's not that they were dealt a bad set of cards, but everyone's decisions up to that point where we are introduced greatly affected the world. Even when you progress through the game, the more bosses you beat, the more the world is twisted. The world is changing with every move you make, and sadly, not in a good way. I mean, humans themselves are curious creatures, so if you have a normal world working to excel and come to find that there are beings in a higher plane of existence, wouldn't you also want to know how that feels like? Not even that. If you found a being and its blood has amazing healing capabilities, wouldn't humans want to utilize it even if you don't really know the side effects or where it truly came from? Understanding the unknown has been a goal of humans for as long as we can remember. But of course, some things you don't fully understand and will probably never understand should be well left alone. Very like our own human history, Bloodborne's lore is incomplete. There are some holes in the story that we haven't really filled in yet. Either that's due to us not fully understanding why the Great Ones do what they do, withholding secrets, or from software just cutting content. We will never have the full picture. We can only speculate and fill in those plot holes. Further emphasizing the points that I made, and the only DLC for Bloodborne, it is more apparent that the people you meet don't want you to find the secrets they are keeping away from you. Further making more holes in the story. From NPCs trying to stop you and invading you to Lady Maria hinting that she doesn't want you to see the secrets beyond her, saying A corpse should be left well alone. Not talking about herself, but the corpse of a great one. And how we are being led by curiosity to find those secrets. Oh, I know very well how the secrets beckon so sweetly. Also tying that to human curiosity. The environmental storytelling, like in any From Software game, is one of the best I've ever seen. It helps us immerse ourselves into the world. What would I do if I was in the shoes of the character I created? Start asking yourself questions like this and start becoming invested in why things are the way they are. It's truly a narrative wonder. I'm not going to deep dive into the story, because God only knows there are more people qualified to give you the story and lore behind this game. But if I can say anything about the story of Bloodborne, the amount of lore backing this game helped it enhance the story overall. The best way you can describe it is if you're building out of Legos, the more Legos you have, the more you have at your disposal to make a masterpiece of a Lego creation. Combining that with the formula of tragedy and despair, which has been a running theme in the Soulsborne series, shows the careful planning of this game and how much they care about the story. Even if they don't give us all the details, I believe they left it out on purpose to have us keep having discussions on the game even years later after the release.
World building. The process of constructing a world originally an imaginary one sometimes associated with a fictional universe and level design. The phase of the game development process that deals with creating stages, maps, and missions of the game. Both of these are needed to make a world worth playing in and fun to be in. Well, I wouldn't say fun in this instance, but an immersive world to be in. They did a fantastic job giving off this horror yet unknown feeling within the game. It's one thing to be scared by darkness, but it's another thing to be scared of the unknown. This feeling ties in and blends the different sections as a whole, yet every area is different in its own unique way, putting us into this post-apocalyptic world overrun by beast horrors beyond your comprehension. The level design reminds me a bit of Dark Souls Remastered's layout. Everything is intertwined, yet still has a very linear level system. There are a lot of shortcuts or even places you can miss if you don't look around thoroughly. You can get so used to this linear system that you're kind of sort of tunnel visioned and usually stay on the main path, but in reality there are a lot of little things to be found off that path. Depending if you decide to explore, you will more than likely be rewarded in some way, shape, or form. You might find a good item, uncover more lore that is told by environmental storytelling, or find a new NPC that can impact the way you progress or even affect the outcome of the game as a whole. This world just seems so surreal. These Elders horrors appearing more and more the longer you play the game. It's a very bizarre feeling to be in this world. Now, there is one thing that fits into this whole world building and level design section, and that is probably the only time I will thoroughly go in depth into. The Chalice Dungeons A little lore lesson. Chalice Dungeons in Bloodborne are vast underground ruins deep beneath the city of Yardo. They offer a chance to experience Bloodborne's sense of exploration, danger, and reward in all new ways. You can access these multi-level dungeons by performing a chalice ritual. Now, take what I said about the fantastic world and level design and completely throw it out the window. This is what From Software did. Sure, it's more content to play and you can get potent materials and items needed, but it just feels lazy. Also, that's not considering the root chalice dungeons in which you can make these dungeons randomly generate. And the farther you get into the non-randomly generated dungeons, the harder and imbalanced to become, to the point where if anything as so much as blows on you, you instantly die. But there are upside to these dungeons. People have found a way to make their own dungeons. These dungeons are called the Save Edit Dungeons, and you can share them with other people. People have been able to make dungeons that can give you thousands of echoes without doing anything and also edit in things that were cut from the main game like different mobs and bosses. The people who researched the lore of this game were able to find out and piece together different theories from these dungeons. So they're not all bad. Of all the Soulsborne games I have played, this game has the fastest pace and most engaging combat I have ever experienced. Unlike in Dark Souls or Elden Ring, where most of the time you roll out of attacks taking advantage of invincibility frames your roll gives you, Bloodborne's dodge is more like a quick step than anything. It feels like you're legitimately dodging an opponent's attack. Combine that with the aggressive nature of almost every enemy in the game, fighting can become extremely fluid. Now, the weapons in this game are simple, yet extremely diverse. There aren't that many weapons in this game to begin with, with the weapon count being 26 in total, while 15 of them are main hand weapons and 11 are sidearms. But all main hand weapons have two completely different forms they can switch from. For example, the threaded cane is what I chose for my starter weapon. Besides it being a cane you can just hit things with, its second mode allows it to turn into a whip, which also completely changes its moveset. Ludwig's Holy Blade starts off as a straight sword but turns into a great sword. Boom Hammer starts off as a hammer but if you switch modes it ignites itself and explodes on impact. It's simple yet there's a lot of things you can do with the few weapons that they give you. To add to that, depending on what combination of attacks you do, you gain a damage multiplier for every consecutive hit. This is why it isn't in your best interest to turtle in a fight and to be consistent consistently engage in one. Furthermore, Rally is a common mechanic in this game in which if you take damage, you have a 5 second window to get a portion of that lost health back if you are able to damage the enemy back a number of times successfully. This further proves the point that being aggressive in this game works really well. Sidearms aren't really meant for damage, but it's mostly used as a pair mechanic allowing you to do a good amount of damage in one go. The way it works is that if an enemy is in the middle of attack and you're able to hit them with the sidearm, it will more than likely stagger them, allowing you to repost them. Be warned, stun enemies can't really be staggered or have really high posture, so staggering them is a bit, well, troublesome. 
all these items, weapons, and mechanics make the combat feel like a smooth back and forth between you and whatever you're fighting. Sekiro also took this approach with this fast and fluid fighting style. If I were to describe the combat in this game with one word, it would be elegant because that's what it truly feels like. An elegant dance between you and whatever you're fighting. The bosses of Bloodborne are a bit of hit or miss for me. Now, don't get me wrong, the designs of these bosses are amazing. Of all the games I have ever played, the design of the bosses is the best I have ever seen. But some of them seem a bit underwhelming, overpowered, or just straight up lazy. There are two different types of bosses in this game, humanoid and beast type bosses. Every boss feels unique. Now it's up to you if they feel unique in a good or bad way, but I did enjoy most of the encounters with the bosses I came across. I do prefer humanoid top bosses instead of beast type bosses because it allows us to be on equal footing, that is why humanoid bosses seem the fairest to fight. Now beast type bosses are a different type of fun if they aren't in general a bad experience to go through. They can have their bones broken, get knocked down, things of that nature that make sense in a real scenario. Now instead of me going through all the bosses and what I thought of them, let me talk about the boss that summed up the collective parts in the game we call Bloodborne. Lady Maria of the Astral Clock Tower Maria is in the same boat as the other hunters in the Hunter's Nightmare, endlessly trapped in here. When we find Maria, we find her in the Astral Clock Tower, dead. Lifeless. It's only when we get near her she springs back to life and hinting to you that it would be in your best interest to leave and stop looking for answers. The answers to understand what happened here and why the hunters were cursed to begin with, with to endlessly hunt in this unending nightmare. She herself wants to help people but in the end she couldn't help anyone. Even trapped in this nightmare she wants to stop you from committing the same mistake she made. The mistake that cursed the hunters. This is my favorite boss in all of the Soulsborne series. I think the best way to describe her fight is a dance. She attacks, I attack. She reads my movements, I read hers. The fight can seem so fluid and beautiful that you feel so immersed into the fight itself. You're truly the character that you created and having a magnificent battle with the most beautiful and kind-hearted woman you have ever seen so far in your journey. One of not many beautiful moments in this sad, disgusting, and horror-filled world. A fight that sums up the theme of a tragic story and the mechanical game achievement of Bloodborne itself. No game is perfect. As I said before, this game has many issues including dungeon balancing, laziness, and also the performance. In a game where every FPS is needed in this fluid and quick combat game, why is it only kept at 30 FPS from software? If you're ever going to touch this game at all, please either release a patch that uncaps the FPS and resolution or port this game to PC. Every person that has enjoyed this game more than I did have been begging for years to have this happen. It's not every day I find a game that gave me such an experience that I would hope to never forget. An excellent, riddle-induced story combined with fun and intuitive gameplay. Not to mention the art direction in this game is an absolute spectacle. It might have a handful of rough edges, but this game is a true gem within the gaming industry. I cannot really explain what this genre means to me and how much I believe it changed me and my taste in gaming for the better. All I can say is, well, thank you. Thank you From Software for creating the Soulsborne series. Thank you for giving me memories, experiences, and feelings I will never forget. Thank you for giving me a journey I never knew I needed. Welcome, weary traveler, to the great city of Yarnum. You must be the new hunter. Ah, you found yourself a hunter. Honorable Hunter, pursue the echoes of blood and I will channel them into your strength. If you find my mom, give her this music box. It plays one of daddy's favorite songs. And when daddy forgets us, we play it for him so he remembers. If you spot anyone with their wits about them, tell them about this here Erden Chapel. They'll be safe here. Our thirst for blood satiates us, soothes our fears. Seek the old blood, but beware the frailty of men. Their wills are weak, 
minds young. The plant makes us human, makes us more than human, makes us human no more. Our eyes are yet to open. Fear the old blood. A hunter of beasts, are you? You know not the value you possess. A most frightful fate. Oh my, not even death offers solace. A cosmos, of course. Let us sit about and speak feverishly, chatting into the wee hours of new ideas of the higher plane. Dear, oh dear, what was it? The hunt? The blood? Or the horrible dream? Oh, it doesn't matter. It always comes down to the hunter's helper to clean up after these sorts of messes. Good hunter, have you seen the thread of light? A fleeting thing, yet I clung to it, steeped as I was in the stench of blood and beasts. Ah, you were at my side all along, my true mentor, my guiding moonlight. A corpse should be left well alone. Oh, I know very well how the secrets beckon so sweetly. Only an honest death will cure you now. Good hunter, you've done well. The night is near its end. Now, I will show you mercy. You will die, forget the dream, and awake under the morning sun.